prototype design the more traditional layouts. However, Eric's refused to take no for an answer. The day after his proposal was rejected, he met with the board and delivered a dazzling one-hour lecture, not only on the merits of his design, but also on his ability to build the vessel in the incredibly brief period of 100 days. Back in the day, the decision to get the design made up. Erickson was ordered to start at once. With neither a comprehensive blueprint nor a scale model of the warship, Erickson worked feverishly, dashing off hundreds of drawings for the new vessel as needed. Its most novel feature was the way it carried its armament. Erickson's design was created to carry a weapon system first. And everything else was secondary to that. It was an excellent fighting machine. It had a gun turret. So it would bring the first clash between ironclad warships in history. They were confident in a Union victory. But back in Washington, the Merrimack is coming. Oh, good, At 8 a.m. on the morning of March 9th, a curl of black smoke appeared on the east side of Hampton Roads, rising from a shaped sunset resembled a floating barn roof. The CSS Virginia was crossing the channel, heading straight to the USS Minnesota. When Virginia came out the next morning, as she was expected to do, at so first Erickson, all she saw Erickson's was boat had two fire. guns, right? And then suddenly this something appeared. The, uh, the boats that Erickson's boat was battling it against was had rows of One guns on both sides. explained that the Union ironclad looked like a tin can on a shingle. Like a the Virginia immediately opened fire. Anybody know who won the battle? Erickson's boat won the battle, right? The one that had two guns. Now, usually when you try to win a naval battle, the, the person who can throw the most cannonballs in the air wins. Does that make sense? The person who can put the most lead in the air wins. But the boat with two guns, instead, I think the other boats had to have 10 on a side. So two to 20. Why did the boat with two guns win? Yeah, it was hard to see. Maybe. I mean, it was the, the way the armor was designed was certainly different, right? So, so the, uh, the sloping sides there would tend to deflect the cannonball away. Yeah. It was also far easier to do. Didn't matter which direction the boat was pointed. Right? Because it wasn't just two guns, it was two guns on a turret. So the enemy vessels could only fire when they were broadside to you. In fact, that's a thing, right? We took we took, you know, four broadsides or whatever it is, right? The old naval battles, the ships would line up and sail past each other and try to fire their cannons at the other ship as they're passing each other. And Erickson changed all of that by building a boat with two guns on a turret. Now, what was his purpose? What was the function that he was trying to do here? What's the function of a cannon on a naval vessel? Yeah. To put holes in, in your opponent's ships? Right, the function of the cannon on a naval vessel in, what was this, 1860-something? Yeah. Must have been, right? 61, 62? 62. 1862, the function of a gun is to put a hole in another boat, right? Or a fortification. Okay. Unless it was out on the battlefield of the, of the army, and then it was like not legs off, right? Yeah. So the function of aiming the gun decoupled with the function of aiming the ship. So his, his design was be, can anybody think of, uh, and so in the, the, all the guns point in one direction, like sometimes they would have one that pointed out the back too, right? One that points out the back. 
to get people that are following you. Otherwise, you have to pass the other ship to the whole zone. Can anybody think of, of something that you use every day that has a coupled design? So we decoupled our design here by aiming the, uh, the gun. That's, a, that's an example of a decoupled design where the function, so two different functions, right? So one function is point the boat and go in a direction with the boat, right? That's one function. The other function is point the guns and fire the guns in the direction you want them to fire. In the traditional naval vessel, those two were coupled. You fired the guns perpendicular to the direction that your boat was moving. Here, Erickson decoupled by firing the guns. So think of something that you use every day that has maybe two functions. Not only two functions, that has a coupled design. Anybody got an idea? Example? Yeah. Uh, a camera on a phone. A camera on a phone. So what are the two functions? Camera on a phone. What are the two functions? To take a picture and take a picture. What's the other function? Call someone. Call someone. So those two things are physically integrated. Are they actually coupled? Do we often take a picture and call someone at the same time? So I would say that there's physical integration here, but I'm not certain that there's coupling that hurts us. Yeah. The light that turns on when you open a refrigerator door. The light that turns on when you open a refrigerator door. So again, those are coupled, and they're coupled on purpose. Okay, what about, what about a bad coupling that we experience almost every day? Or a bad, maybe too strong of a term here. Less desirable. In a car. In a car? Because there's like, you get a bike so it kind of crashes. And you don't okay. Have to focus on the same so so we, we, we wastefully move this extra mass around sometimes when we don't need to. We help my car has seven seats, right? But I live here by myself today. Whew, it was hard to get out of the car this morning. It was really hard to get out of the car this morning because my seat has a heater in it. So here's the guy actually uh, got a funny story. I don't have to tell that story now. Um, yeah. So what about? Actually, I'm going to tell this story. Now, nah, let's get that one too. But um, what do all employees have to do before returning to work? When was the last time you were in a public key bathroom and uh, you saw that sign? Anybody? Last time you were in a public key bathroom and you saw a sign, all employees must wash hands before returning to work. Somebody. Like yesterday? Like within the past month, maybe. Yeah, within the past month. Anytime you've been to a bathroom in a restaurant, you've seen the sign. Right? Okay, so who has seen? So if we get a top down view of our sink. Yeah. You said your uh, on your phone there's a pop-up for low battery. Really? Low battery again? It is totally low battery. Where's my friend with the extra battery charger thing? <laughs> I almost went back to my office and got one today. See where? I think I can plug it into the monitor. That's teamwork right there. Don't allow. Okay. So we've got our top down view of our sink. Wait, who's ever. Who, who lives in an old house? 
few of you rent an apartment in Worcester. Most of those, most of those three acres were built around between 1890 and 1920. So anybody have one where you've got the, the spigot here for cold water and the spigot here for hot water? You have one of those sinks in your house? Yeah. So when you want to wash your hands with cold water, no problem. Right? Turn this one on. Put your hands under it. It sprays everywhere too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because those old valves tend to be on and off. I mean, there's, you could, if you're careful, you can adjust them a little bit. But usually when I turn mine on, water splashes out, gets all over me. Uh, hot water, no problem. You turn this one on, it starts out cold. Then it becomes hot. Yes. And there's that moment when it's going from cold to hot where it feels pretty good. Yeah. Right? If you want warm water, you can put the little stopper thing in, right? And you turn this one on, you turn this one on, you let it fill up, and then you can lather your hands up, and then you can rinse your hands in the dirty water, right? So what's the, what's the natural improvement to this, right? And, and, and I bet you let, most of you live in a place that has the, the next step up from this. Combining the two spigots. Yeah, so let's put a pipe here between the two valves. And then it comes out like this, right? And these have those, those cool looking handles, right? The knob things, they're like, like fake crystals. You've seen these handles, right? Mm -hmm. The fake crystal handles. And so those, those are cool. You, you know why if you live in a, in a Worcester apartment and you have those fake handles? You know why you have that uh, faucet? Because it costs like $14 to buy that one. That's what your landlord is willing to spend on your bathroom faucet. All right, so, so now, when I want warm water, what do I have to do? What's the process to get warm water out of this? Just the temperature I want, yeah. Turn both faucets, or both handles. All right, so I'm gonna go like this. And then it sprays me in the face again. Or I could turn one slowly and then turn the other one slowly. So we can avoid the getting sprayed in the face, right? So what are the functions that we want from this faucet? There's two main functions we want from this faucet. And I mean, this is like a standard. This is a big step above your faucet. Big step above. You wish you had one of those, right? Well, I do in my bathroom. Okay. That's like this in the basement. So okay. That's Controllable temperature. So I want to control temperature. I want to control the temperature. That's that's one function. What's the other function that I want to do with a faucet like this? I want to control the volumetric flow rate, maybe. Because those sinks are very deep, right? They're pretty shallow. The water splashes back out of them if you get too much volume coming. So how do I do both with this? Can I control both volumetric flow rate and temperature with this? Yes. <coughs> so it works in that, in that sense. It's a functional <coughs> design. But it's coupled, correct? Because if I want to change the volume, so say I've got the temperature all set, but it's just dripping out. I want a little bit more flow. I adjust the hot, now it's too warm, but it's flowing better. I adjust the cold, now it's the right temperature, but it's flowing too much. And so I can solve my problem of both flow rate and temperature control, but I have to iterate. So that design is also coupled, but it's better than the first design. What else can we do? Combine the two knobs into one handle, rotate it one way for temp, the other way for... That was the first way people solved this, right? So you've got, you've got a valve now that has one control, and turning it this way will adjust the mix of hot to cold, the percentage of hot to cold, and moving it up and down will adjust the volumetric flow rate. And so that design, the, the components are all physically coupled together, right? So like on our phone here, our components are physically coupled together, but since we don't typically use those two features at the same time, it's not really a, a detriment. Here, we 
physically couple the parts together, but we've allowed the control to be independent. So rotation adjusts temperature, and in and out or up and down adjusts volume. So we've got a decoupled design there. Now, before we get to do this, so, be, so these were the functions that we wanted, right? These were the functions that we wanted. Before we got to get our functions, what did we have to know? So the designer decided, and so let's call these functional requirements. So the designer said, we have functional requirement, FR number one is control, Temp. And FR number two is control and so and so when I call these functional requirements here, I, I always start a functional requirement with a back with a verb. So this is the function that my design has to satisfy. And in the functions that we want to satisfy, these are always verbs. So what are some, some other designs that we see that have functions? So our, go, go back to our camera on the phone. So one of the functions was to take and store pictures. One of the functions was to be able to place and receive phone calls. Right, so those are two functions. So take and store features, maybe that's two functions. One of them just take pictures, the other one's store pictures. Take and receive phone calls, maybe that's two functions, maybe that's one function, you can decide that yourself right now. Usually we don't like to have and in our functional requirements. <clears throat> so why do we want to be able to take and store pictures? Because Back in the day when I was a kid, phones didn't take pictures. In fact, when I was in high school, we had a party line. That meant that if the phone rang, ring, that was our neighbor's phone call. If it rang, ring, 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 that was our phone call. And I think at one point we had three different rings. Now, there's two, they didn't have ringtones either, you know. It was a friggin' bell with a little vibrating clapper on it. And so all they could do was tell it how long to vibrate. So back in the day, we didn't have pictures on our phones. So why did we decide, we, yeah? So that we don't have to carry around the camera. So someone decided we didn't want to carry around two, two devices. Who's the person that decided they didn't want to carry around two devices? The customer, right? So presumably, the customer said, hey, I'm really tired of carrying my Instamatic and my brick phone. It, at least we've gotten to where we carry the phone around. But I'm tired of carrying around these two devices. Build me a better device that has two of them. And so what they did is they physically integrated a camera and a phone. Right? But the customer, so before we get functional requirements, before we get our functional requirements over here, control temperature, control flow rate, the customer has to say, I need so the customer says, I need this. We determine that the customer needs something, then we figure out what functions do we have to do in order to meet the customer's needs. So we'll call those C and customer needs. Alright, so if I have FR1, FR2, because the customer said I want to control temperature, or what did the customer say? What, what, what does the customer say here? What did I say? I want warm temperature to wash my hands without getting splashed in the face. So as the customer, what I want is warm hands and not splashes on the face. Whose job is it to figure out how to go from that customer need of 
warm, not splashiness to control temperature, control flow rate. Whose job is that? Is the manufacturing engineer's job? The designer. The design engineer, right? The designer, because remember back, back in the beginning of the class we talked about this flow from art to park? We said the art defines the design, right? The art defines the design. And that art part is the design, is the designer's job. And as manufacturing engineers, we don't usually get to affect the upstream design. Upstream design. <coughs> of, of the parts. As manufacturing engineers, we usually have to take what the designer gives us. And so for the whole previous part of the term, we've been wearing the hat of manufacturing engineer. Right now we're gonna step back and we're going to be able to influence the design. So, so today's lecture is talking about how do we on purpose get the design that we want. And so we can get our functional requirements here. The designer gets to choose these and, uh, and so the desire, so it's like a word problem, right? The first step is to understand what the problem is, right? The customer gives us these wishy-washy requirements. What are some, um, all right. Who's ever driven a car? We've all driven a car? Okay. We've all driven a car. When you're driving somewhere in a car, what are the customer needs that apply? What do you, as the customer, as the driver of the car, what do you need? To stay safe. So I need to be safe. What else do I need as the driver of a car? You need to accelerate, decelerate, and turn. Aren't all those things just accelerating in different directions? Yeah. I need to accelerate. Alright, but you said, you said right, left, fast, slow, right? And we're the customers, we're recording the customer's needs now, so. And probably start, stop. That was included. <coughs> what else do I need as the customer? some comfort. Right? Now, different customers have different comfort needs, right? Are we talking about like scented candles in the bath kind of comfort? I mean, that would be or are we talking about the <coughs> The feeling of being pushed back into the seat during hard acceleration. Because different people find different things comfortable, right? But comfort, right? The customer needs comfort, yeah. Like temperature control. So, 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 temp. That is important today. Temperature control, um, firmness of the seat, right? Anybody, so you've been in a car that has adjustable seats where they like, they, they tip forward and backward too. Anybody ever play around with the controls on those adjustable seats on a leather seat and like tip it so far forward you feel like you're sliding off the seat? Yeah, so you might need friction between your caboose area and the seat. So those are some comfort things. What else do we need as customer needs because somebody had to design a car, right? They didn't just come up, yeah. You need to be able to see out of the windshield. Visibility. Have you ever drive a big RV? Backwards? Can't see anything behind you, right? How do they fix that? Because they fixed it. Put a camera. They put a camera, right? <clears throat> Actually, half the half the new cars on the market today, you can't see anything behind you without a camera, right? Um, 
Um, so you need visibility not just in front but all directions. What else do we need as a as a, what are our needs as the customer? There's a fundamental need. I need to go <coughs> I think we're done with water valves for now. If we get back to why I'm driving the car, right? And I, and I phrased the question on purpose to make you think of you were driving the car. But let's get back to why we're driving the car. I want to go, I want transportation. From wherever the hell I am to where I want to be. Right? Sort of like that G01 in our, in our CNC code, right? It goes from wherever the hell the machine is to where you told it to go. So we want transportation. That's the fundamental need, right? If we're driving a car? Probably. It could be that we just wanted to go for a drive. And we didn't actually need to go anywhere. We wanted to experience all these things. But we would like to think that the primary role of the car is to provide us with that transportation. So, how do I take safe and make it functional requirements? So safe, we, we intuitively understand what safe is, right? How do I create functional requirements that define safe? We don't have to go through all of them, but what's, what's the process? What are we gonna do if we want a functional requirement that makes our car safe? Because visibility impacts safe, right? Visible and safe are related. If we can't see, then it's not likely for it to be safe for us to drive. So what, what functions does a car have that increase its safety? Airbags. All right, so we could have safety safety systems that are designed to protect us in case something goes wrong, right? We have safety systems, so what does the airbag do? It controls our acceleration in the event that the car is accelerating by stopping, right? It controls our deceleration in the event that the car is decelerating faster than our body can stand. That's, that's the function of an airbag, right? So it's supposed to explode out and then deflate just as you impact them. So they're, they're actually not like you bump into the cushion, they're supposed to deflate as your face is hitting them. My face has never hit an airbag, but it has hit a dashboard. And it would've been better, I think, had there been an airbag. Nine years old, left a hole that big of a dashboard with my face. But the car decelerated faster than my body could take. Um, all right, so safety systems like airbags. So the airbag, the function of the airbag is to control deceleration of the human body inside the car. Um, what else? Seat belts. So seat belts. So seat belt is the thing that provides the safety. What's the function of the seat belt? Why did they first start doing seat belts? I mean, they've gotten them much better now with the, because they, they grab you also, so they also help with the deceleration. But the initial seat belt, what was the function of it? Stop you flying through the windshield. Keep you in the car. So keep passenger in car when stuff goes bad. Um, the glass 
glasses and dry mask like shatter. So people get hurt by flying glass. And so they have a functional requirement of don't allow the glass to hurt the occupants in case of accident. That's a functional requirement. The way they do it is they got all these fancy layers of polymer, they glue them together with different layers of glass and all that stuff. It's pretty amazing. Um, last, go to mouse, otherwise I'm going to go to sleep. Oh wait, I guess you don't care. Last August, I think it was last August, the city of the intersection of Park Ave and Highland Street on Highland going towards downtown. So I'm coming from the rotary back to Park Ave, sitting in the left hand turn lane, blinker on, waiting for my turn. And the rear window of my car exploded. I literally thought somebody shot the car. Like I thought it was a gunshot. I looked at it, it's all spidery out. I get out, I just, I put it in park, I get out, the lights turning green, I walk over, there's a tow truck that's sort of diagonally next to my window. I was like, did you see what happened? He's like, no, it just exploded. I'm looking at it. So I, I make the turn, I pull into the Price Chopper parking lot, and I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on. It turns out, they call it, uh, there's, a, there's a thing for it. Sometimes car windows explode. <laughs> the pieces don't go anywhere, they all stay there, in fact, I haven't replaced it yet. I just covered it with black duct tape because it was a tinted window. <laughs> when you see the, the GTA Katie with the black duct tape window, that's me. I'm going to have to replace it this month because I need a new sticker. But um, it's a thing. And so it's because of the way they manufacture those windows. So they say that it could have had an impact. So they, they shatter like that when they get impacted. That's, that's the purpose. It, it broke the way it was supposed to break. But the impact could have been hours or days before sometimes. It puts a little stress there, starts the little crack, and then eventually, especially if it changes temperature, August, like the sun was hitting it, is what bang, exploded. Um, I'm fairly certain that it was because I was teaching my daughter how to throw a Frisbee about two hours before that trip. And I remember at one point deciding that we should move to the backyard because the Frisbee was bouncing out the car too much. So I'm pretty sure my daughter hit the car with a frisbee and that's why the window exploded, but whatever. It was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And it, it, the incident of it was pretty scary because I literally thought the car had been shot, um, which can happen in Ulster. Um, uh, all right, so we gotta, we got to understand the customer's needs. We have to define the functions that help us understand the customer needs. And then, and then we create a design parameter Okay, so we get this process, customer need, functional requirement. And the next step is a design parameter. The design parameter is the thing that defines how we're going to meet the functional requirement. And so, if the, and the design parameters do not start with verbs. The design parameters are nouns, and they're things, and you usually can put a tolerance on them. So it's, it's a number, it's a thing that you can know when you've gotten there. And so if we do customer needs, functional requirements, design parameters, and so if um, we've got our, where's my slides? And so when we get to the point where we have our drawing, right, so we get to the point where we have our drawing, so there's a design parameter here that says 0.996 inches, and I can't read the tolerance block, but it's probably plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. So 0.996 inches, plus or minus five thousandths of an inch, that is this dimension. And so that is a design parameter. What's the functional requirement behind that design parameter? Anybody know? Have you seen how one of these, you, you recognize the part, right? Have you seen how one of these assembles together? It was a picture of one on the, like the home of the Canvas site for the class. You see how one of these fit together? So there's the cylinder, 
pushing you is making the cylinders now. The cylinder gets clamped in there, and then the clamp can hold it down. This part goes into the base. The function of that part, one, is to fit in the base. There's a hole, there's a pocket in the base. The function of that pocket is to accept this thing coming into it. Right? The functional requirement, though, is to allow the surfaces to interact. And so that's why we have those dimensions on there. Uh, any idea what the functional requirement is between this 2.25 inches, the height? Why do we care about the height of this wide block? Why not, why not make it three inches? Why do we care what the height was? There's a function behind that distance. Yep. Allows space to put fire. Right. It allows us to have a fire with a flame that hits the test tube at the right height. So we can adjust that to get a different design. Uh, so what's the function for the spacing dimension on these two holes? That's the design parameter on there. What's the function about that? So that it holds the clamp. Like it is, and the, the functional requirement for the spacing comes from the fact that we buy those clamps. So the holes have to be the same distance apart as the holes in the clamps within some tolerance, right? And so there's a functional requirement behind each of the design parameters that you see on one of these drawings. Now, who's ever designed something? What was the first thing you did when you designed something? Uh, start with just a basic block and let it extrude from it or take away from it. So you get a basic block that you think your part fits in, and you take away material from it. So it's sort of like our CNC machining, right? So did you sit down and consider what the customer needs? Yeah. Okay. Un understand what your final. So the first thing you did was consider the customer needs, right? Did you, did you formally go through a process of writing down functional requirements, things that you needed to do? Not always. No. Who, how about you? Well, I generally... You considered the customer needs, right? You had some idea what you wanted the design to do. And then you sat down with Kat, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It, it, do you, would you be willing to believe that the typical way stuff gets designed is we think we know what the customer wants in our head. And we sit down with Kat, so mechanical components. Software the same way? Anybody, anybody a CS major? You're a CS major? What's, when you get a new project, so they say we need a program or an app or whatever it is that you're coding, they tell you what they want to do, right? And what's the first thing that you want to do? Figure out all the requirements. Oh, that's the first thing you should want to do. First thing you want to do, though, is go sit down and start coding, right? First thing we, it is, is mechanical design engineers, the first thing we want to do is we want to start drawing the solution. Because we've got like five ways to solve that problem in our head already. If you don't sit down and figure out what the actual requirements are before you start designing, how much time do you spend debugging? More than you would otherwise. Yeah, so I spent three days coding the project, three weeks debugging it. But if you take, take the time up front to design the software, design the part, and the design isn't the drawing. Like the drawing is the last part of the design. In CS, the coding is the last part of the design. The co in, in fact, if it's designed well enough, a monkey can write the code, right? They actually have high level programming languages where, where people like me, it is like I wanted to do this, and then, then there's some automated like expert system that goes and looks up the functions that do the thing I said. I can say it in words for what I wanted to do. Um, so, if you don't fully understand the functions of what you want to do, your design is going to be crap. This much I say. Okay, what else we got? We got 45. What did I say we are going to do 45? You guys want to look at some crappy designs? I got some for you. Eleven hysterical examples of bad design.
This one took a minute to figure out what they were trying to say. Oh, this one's hilarious. I'm not sure this is a design fault. I'm pretty sure that this is just an idiot driver, but it's funny. You see what the problem is, right? <laughs> and that's as far as I watched. I don't know how long it goes on. Uh, apparently, this was a thing, but I don't usually watch the Miss Universe pageant. But apparently, um, the the host announced USA as the uh, as the winner, not realizing the Philippines was the winner here. Sort of sucks for everybody. I, that was a little weird. <laughs> okay, the building's on fire. Let's get out of here. the end of that one. <coughs> who, who sees a bad design just about every day? You, you, you just like, every day you say, what a stupid way to do that as you walk by. <laughs> you guys do that? Yeah, that's why you're here. You can't help it. Continue. Um, what are we doing now? Um, next week? What's next week about? Oh, I know. I, I got to talk to you about homework. That's what it is. Uh, so next homework assignment is coming up today. I'll uh, have it done by Tuesday next week. Uh, as part of the next homework assignment, you notice the new check-in thing at the lab. If you've been to the lab since yesterday, you've noticed it. Um, so is there anybody here who's already an advanced user or a lab monitor in the lab? One, at least the TA, so good. Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, so before next Tuesday, actually before you go to lab, next week, so before you go lab on Monday or Tuesday, depending on when you have a lab, uh, you're going to go to the MFP labs, what, what is it, wpi.mfplabs.org. I'm, I'm going to give you the written instructions. You go to wpi.mfplabs.org, follow the instructions to become a basic user of the facility. It should take you 20 minutes to, um, 20 minutes to an hour to go through the material, take the quiz that demonstrates that you've gone through the material. Then when you get to lab, you're going to tap your ID on the card reader that's outside the door now. Um, the first time, it's going to ask you to type in your ID number. As long as you've already completed all those quizzes to become a basic user, when you type in your ID number, your ID is already going to be in the system, and it's going to say, great, tap again to check in. If you have not yet done that, it's going to tell you that we can't find you in the system because you didn't follow instructions. Or if there's no lab monitor, it will just be a big sign that says the lab is closed. No, I mean, uh, they have not finished the basic user interface and now they're finished. Don't worry about the bug in the software. I'm telling you how the software is supposed to act. <laughs> how the software actually acted this morning. It'll be fixed by the time they do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, and so, uh, and so once you're in this system, there's no longer a need to pick up a phone and call a lab monitor when you arrive. When you arrive, you tap your ID. Lab monitor has a device that says, hey, Joe's here. If lab monitor wants to, they can click on Joe and say, oh, Joe's a basic user and he knows how to use the bandsaw and the drill press. Or Sally. It could be Sally, too. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so we're just rolling out this new map entrance system. That's going to be part of moving that. It's going to be part of your homework. We're going to come here a few days.
I, yeah. I don't know how well this wire works because the low battery thing's still there. Um, it might be broken. No, no, but it worked enough to make it not time out. So it's good. just the phone was using.